Okay, greetings everyone. My name is Kali Akuno, uh, coming to you live from quarantine in Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> um, pleasure for everyone to be here. Uh, I am representing the Institute for Social Ecology, uh, and this is another one of our uh, ongoing series uh, around uh, the intersections of race uh, and the ecology, uh, particularly looking at these last couple of pieces that we've been doing uh, around climate justice and the climate justice movement. Uh, and today uh, we are honored to have a uh, friend and comrade and colleague, uh, Monica Atkins, uh, to join us. Uh, she is one of uh, the co-executive directors of the Climate Justice Alliance. Um, and I want to uh, uh, applaud uh, both Monica and uh, the coalition for doing uh, and trying to innovate really in a lot of ways on a, a kind of collective decision uh, making kind of leadership within this particular uh, sector of the movement. Uh, and it's not just that. I mean, if you look at, I'm, I'm doing a little plug here for the Climate Justice Alliance, so y'all bear with me. But, uh, you know, uh, it's three co-directors and uh, all are women and, and uh, two of the three are uh, women of color, uh, black woman and indigenous woman, and there's very few organizations uh, around that can make any claim uh, such as that. So uh, with my cooperation Jackson hat on, uh, I'm very proud of, uh, you know, this transformation and where the organization is going and uh, happy to be in dialogue uh, today uh, and to bring some, some critical things to you. So um, Monica, I just want to jump into it because I know time is, is, you know, is always sparing. So I really want to focus in on kind of where the climate justice movement from your perspective and what you're seeing, you know, in, in your position uh, uh, as one of the leaders of the Climate Justice Alliance, um, you know, where this movement is at. And the thing that's kind of drawn, what I want to start with is drawn the most focus um, at least on a popular level, the last couple of years is, is this conversation around the Green New Deal, right? And that's been a dominant thing, you know, since it was introduced, was it 2018 or reintroduced, I should say, really, because uh, there were other iterations of it before uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, Ortiz, um, uh, put that out, just so folks know that uh, Green Party and other form formations uh, have been using some of that language before. So just to set the historical record uh, clear, at least in this venue. Uh, but, you know, they definitely took the concept and have popularized it. Now, it hasn't, it's still very amorphous in the way that they're framing it, but it's still kind of the dominant framework, uh, at least amongst the movement. Uh, and there was a great hopes that uh, with the number of kind of new progressives, many of them, um, uh, members of the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, that kind of came into to Congress, that they were going to be able to push this agenda. That hasn't panned out, um, you know, the way that I think many envisioned it or, uh, or hoped it to be, and, and definitely looking at uh, where things stand with uh, the pushback on uh, uh, Biden's, um, what was the Build Back Better plan, um, you know, it, it's been very limited in terms of, you know, what is actually moving. So I, my question to you in, in the midst of this, in the midst of this framework, since it seems like that door is closed, you know, what do you think the climate justice movement should be focusing on now? I well, definitely want to put take my CJA hat off and my cooperation Jackson hat on and say, you know, thank you for that intro and that, you know, um, I feel like, yeah, Cooperation Jackson definitely pressed me and, and gave me the footing that I needed also to be in this role now. So much big up to Cooperation Jackson for that. And yeah, just want to also say thank you to the Institute for Social Ecology for having me as well and you all for joining. Um, so yeah, on the Green New Deal and uh, climate justice movement, where we need to go. I, you know, we CJA put out, um, put forth the people's orientation for a regenerative economy, which really is for like the policymakers and communities alike to really center like frontline leadership and the solutions. And so, you know, we know that those that have been 
most impacted are the ones that are creating the solutions because they've been paying the price, you know, with their bodies, um, with their lives, their communities, you know, paying the price of extraction of Mother Earth and her people. So, you know, there has to be some acknowledgement, you know, that there's no quick techno fix, I would say, to repair Mother Earth. And there's like a deep responsibility of our government also to really end this extractive economy and reduce the emissions at, at their source and shut down this industrial pollution. Um, some of the measures and policies that we, you know, that support the extractive economy or have been aimed to really place profit over anything. And so some of the um, loopholes for carbon markets and the techno fixes are really only serving to enrich, you know, the polluting corporations that's also continuing to cause the harm and devastation on our community. So some of the examples where we see this is like being able to allow for um, net zero emissions. So, you know, we have to be really clear and I would say resolute and honoring the experiences of frontline communities, you know, whose solutions have been directly addressing the climate crisis and don't look to harm uh, Mother Earth or our people. And so, um, you know, the, the ways that folks have been doing that is looking at, uh, you know, the non-extractive, how we make non-extractive and equitable investments to frontline communities and workers have to be really centered in, in that as well. So I would say like the solutions that, you know, have been coming from grassroots communities, um, you know, they have been really moving us away from, you know, fossil fuel economy and forging us towards more local and community controlled renewable energy projects that stop these kind of harmful practices that, um, you know, continue to devastate our communities. And so, you know, the Build Back Better Act, we see invest in some of those dirty energy technologies that are gonna continue to just exasperate the issues for our communities. And they do that by providing kind of tax credits um, that kind of subsidize and incentivize, you know, continue oil and gas extraction. And so I think we just have to be clear and knowing that like that act will not be a climate justice bill with those type of investments being made. So yeah, I guess when I think about how we position ourselves, I think like continuing to invest in grassroots leadership and capacity, there's a lot of organizing that's happening now across the country uh, from, you know, older environmental justice and climate justice organizations and, and newer ones. And even I would say unorganized people have been coming together to create different committees, um, you know, to address the, and meet, address the issues in their workplaces and in their communities. And so being able to really take on, um, you know, take time and investing in those, those new organizing bodies that are coming uh, coming together and also those communities that, you know, have been leading with these solutions for so long. Um, and I think like, you know, the, the grassroots organizing that has been happening, um, it really does build the capacity towards some of those like community control renewable projects that have been implemented and proven to work as well. So, you know, this means I think we need to really take, make the development of these, like those type of projects, um, those type of projects need to be what is centered and resources, resource when it comes to like local grain new deals. And so, you know, and I'm not only resourcing them, but also making sure that those projects are housed in local communities that are impacting um, those neighborhoods directly. So, you know, if we have people who come into our communities and tell us, you know, here are the benefits of, you know, a particular bill or a project, but, you know, they really, they deem those things as solutions, but it, at the, on the back end, it kind of enables some of those corporations to keep polluting. Um, you know, that's an example of what we don't want to see happen. And so wanting to see our community members be trained if additional support is needed um, and, and opportunities where they can be employed to, to take on these projects that directly impact their communities. And so, you know, I think uh, we need to continue also working across sector issues. I think there's an opportunity, you know, for us to also work with labor. And, you know, you mentioned like our alliance is making this shift right now. We see a lot of, a lot of organizations making a shift to these different leadership models. So really centering black and indigenous voices 
And I think another voice, uh, other voices to be centered are also youth. Um, you know, we see a lot of our movement elders these past couple of years have also um, transitioned out uh, transitioned out of leadership or have actually gone on and passed away. And so making sure that we're uh, building our movement to be intergenerational as well so that that work can, can continue. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll pause there. I got uh, many ideas and points that started jumping across my, my head with that question. But I do think, um, you know, what we, what we have been building for a long time is what we need to continue to work towards, and that's uh, building grassroots organizing power across sectors. Uh, you know, I'm gonna agree with that uh, 100%. Um, my, my next question has to do with some of the challenges we are gonna face, I think, in, in moving in that um, direction. Um, I'm one. Uh, just to to frame the 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 question and I guess the subjectivity, I'm one who I think unfortunately thinks um, the the Republicans are likely uh, to have control of the House and Senate. Um, you know, by the end of this year, going into January 2023, um, it just what can we do if if this is what plays out and even most of the uh, prognosticators say this is likely you know just given history given trends given how uh there are these these shifts you know typically in in u.s politics uh from election cycle to the next midterm of of you know party affiliation switching uh, over in terms of who's running stuff um how do we, in your mind, how do we start preparing, you know, youth to deal with the potential kind of not just uh, policy limitation, but the, the the backlash and the the repression that that might come, you know? Uh, and I'm saying this just so everybody is is clear and putting this out, you know, um, for all of us to consider, not just Monica, but for all of us to consider. Um, this is a real question because, you know, if you look at Oklahoma, not too far away from where I'm at here in Mississippi, you know, it's illegal to, to protest against basically oil and gas and fracking, you know, within that state as it stands right now. And it, that's not the only state that has it. I mean, that one has some of the worst laws. Um, so as a, as a younger movement is dealing with this existential threat to its future and gaining more consciousness, which we see every single day, we know that folks are going to eventually start taking more concerted direct action, you know, uh, uh, to try to push back, you know, and how do we start preparing folks uh, for this kind of struggle ahead if uh, uh, this turn winds up being what comes to pass come, come January? Like, how do we, those of us with a little bit of experience with some gray hairs, how do we start being in some dialogue uh, uh, with folks to, to help them prepare you know, for this next period. I got a few little gray hairs, so I guess I could. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think um, our government definitely has proven that they don't care <laughs> about the people more than they care um, about industry. And I think it still goes back to to organizing. Some of the things that we have been seeing um, is co-optation. You know, some of the folks who are against us using our own language against us. Um, and using it to, yeah, again, put, you know, pose these these false solutions that really don't uh, work and, and continue to pollute the communities. Um, so we'll definitely have to be thinking about that. I think that there has to be, when we think about policy advancements, it has to be rooted in uh, communities that are accountable, like environmental justice and climate justice communities that are really accountable in their communities and or in and organizing in their efforts so that they can see real change. So it's it's um you know I think it's um organizing. I mean I feel like the pol the, the policy advancements have been kind of we haven't had enough policy advancement and I think um a lot of it has to do with 
kind of stand chasing a system that had, wasn't intended for us to work, uh, that wasn't intended to work for us on our behalf. So, um, you know, when I think about like some of the, the things that we need to really be mindful about is having a base. I do think it's, you know, important to have like elected officials that we, you know, have um, that come from our base and that come from our movement. But I also think it's very important to have a base so organized to the point to still hold those. There's only so much that those elected officials would be able to do. Um, so really being able to hold those folks accountable to to build towards what we want to what we want to see. Um, you know, I do think we have to be bringing, continue to bring like all of the people who are on the front line. So educators, healthcare workers, um, youth, you know, black and indigenous people, bringing those folks together as we build out plans um, so that we are truly prepared to govern when, it's, when, when we win. Okay, so claiming that. Um, but we honestly really can't rely on those people who created the problem for us like to fix those, uh, to fix it and um, and address it with their false solutions. So, you know, we really have to look at um, centering and being in right relationship with the earth, um, being in right relationship with each other and, you know, looking at the, the solutions that have, have um, proven to work in, in local communities. So I definitely think, you know, narrative, uh, the narrative work is gonna be very important for us as a climate justice movement, I think it's going to be important for us also to um, look at the ways that you know our movements have 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 failed in the past, or what attentions are the things that we you know our, our relationships are they strong enough to kind of withhold the resources that are be coming down to try to take us off our path uh, for liberation. So yeah, we have to gain more control of. Some of the media, you know, media companies, there's a lot of control, uh, you know, with the, the news outlets and what was portrayed and what's pushed out. So, again, I think it all circles back to organizing. But, the, the, you know, I think um, co-optation is going to be our biggest um, of the language that we use and the way that we organize. So being very mindful of, of controlling our narrative. Definitely agree on that. Um, definitely agree on that. If 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 we can, just a detour, just a quick second to talk about some of that narrative stuff, Monica. Um, uh, you you spoke about net zero, and I want you, if you can, to just break that down. Um, not just for this audience, you know, but for the audience, the the large audience, that to see this on the video. Because that's one of the the main terms that you hear Biden and and uh, most of the Democrats are kind of throwing out uh, as if that's a solution, right? Um, and then another one that 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 uh, just kind of cropped up in the last year um, uh, that I guess was highlighted at the, over at the uh, COP uh, twenty six was a uh, uh, was it nature based solutions? Was that was that the term that they or kind of just recently came up with? Mm -hmm. um um so just what those mean you know um uh just so folks kind of have a, a a bit of a reference like why why should we oppose net zero you know what why why should our communities why should our folks uh, uh not see that as a positive thing yeah, because I mean I think it, it ultimately just continues the pollution we think about how um you know, the fracking, coal mining, um, you know, the gases that, that pollute our communities, um, that's, that's really what um, the impacts of net, net zero and these nature-based solutions haven't um, really been, um, that this is where some of the co-optation, you know, making it sound like it's really to repair the earth and it's really to, um, you know, give, uh, you know, we think about just transition, we talk about building regenerative economies. And so it leans more towards some of that language than it is, uh, but in, in actual practices, kind of, a, again, one of those things I mentioned around like techno fixes, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's still gonna create more pollutants and, you know, also like uh, give tax breaks and benefits to, you know, these uh, corporations as well. So, you know, when thinking about um, what it truly means that the, the source of it is not a 
it's a false solution. Um, so those are some of the things that, yeah, like kind of come up when I think about net, net zero emissions. And I, I wanted to, to focus in on that one, um, you know, just to give more definition, because uh, there's some some very serious marketing uh, of these, you know, in black and indigenous communities, like different kind of policies that that are being pushed, you know, uh, by the Biden and the Democrats, it's like, you know, solutions that we should all uh, be getting behind, right? Um, and this leads me to like, you know, this, this, I want you to speak about just um, how do you see the intersection between the, the Black Liberation Movement, particularly, you know, this, the, 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 the iteration of it, you know, now, right, uh, under the kind of the banner of like Black Lives Matter and, you know, the, the explosion that I was glad to be able to witness in 2020 of things like how, how should that relate you know, to the climate justice movement, because it seems like, you know, there's some overlap, but but not enough. And one of the main groups that's being targeted, like for these false solutions, and in, in, in even job creation stuff, is the black community in particular, uh, under a lot of these net zero carbon, you know, supposedly, like allegedly neutral kind of uh, solutions. Uh, uh, and if I dare may just speak, you know, uh, Real truth, real talk. Uh, you know how the 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 climb, how the uh, the carbon uh, industry has so many black elected officials, particularly in the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, uh, in their back pocket. You know, uh, so this is something that, speaking subjectively, our movement is going to have to figure out a better way to both identify, recognize, and then figure out how to deal with. So if you could speak to to that, you know, from your from your perspective, I think that would be, you know, good for us all to glean from. Yeah, Ooh, I definitely think you know, even thinking about our origin stories for like climate justice and um, how the Black Liberation Movement intersects. Like our, you know, story is first documented in, you know, Warren County in a Black community where they organized to win. So you know, part of you know the work I think is being able to tell the stories and, you know, which is similar to so many other struggles where folks who actually had did the hard work got erased. So I think one thing is, um, you know, to actually remind folks that both of these movements are, are actually very tied to, together as well as like indigenous liberation struggles too. Um, but I do see where there has been more focus and emphasis on like the policy work and like electoral organizing. Um, when I think about like, yeah, some of the national movements that, you know, have been, have been um, you know, organizing, especially over these last uh, couple of years, I think there's a, a big divergence in like grass, when it comes to like grassroots organizing and bottom up organizing and some of that policy, yeah, and electoral work. Um, I think it's important for, the organizing to be leading the strategy of policy. And because that system is so difficult and on purpose, um, it makes us spend a lot of time in that extractive economy and in this like, you know, cycle of, of trying, to, trying to make something get, you know, trying to get something passed. Um, and so, um, you know, opportunities, I think where we can lean in, I do think that the policy work is important. Um, but I'm more so um, hoping that we can lean into like the power of the people, you know, and really having a base base of folks to push because what we want to do is move out of that system completely. And if we just keep giving it the energy, then we don't really build towards the liberation that we're trying to, um, that we are going to get. Um, so those are some of the, the, yeah, things that I'm seeing is us really tightening up on our, how we organize in that, that in that world, you know, when it comes to like policy and legislation, but also um, really investing and in being sincere about like power building and the solutions that we have been um, grassroots organizing in frontline communities. Now, you know, I got to ask you in a similar vein, right, about the, the, 
the intersection between the women's movement and the climate justice movement, right? Um, and 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 I'm saying that just because of the the some of the things I see Climate Justice Alliance, you know, really now embodying, you know, uh, and stepping into. Um, and we know that that um, even within our own movements, um, you know, there's still profound imbalance on the question of of the distribution of power in our own movements and organizations, you know, uh, along the questions of, of sex and gender that we have to, to you know, uh, figure out how to unravel, uh, untangle. <clears throat> um, so y'all are taking some steps, I think, in, in, in the lead. So share with us some secrets. How do we how do we do better in this regard? How do our movement do, do, uh, should it do better in this regard? Yeah, I, it's a practice. It's a practice. Uh, I'm gonna say that's the number one is to continue to practice it even when it gets hard. Um, you know, I feel like I have learned a lot about principal struggle over these last couple of years, and um, you know, really working across those bridges that sometimes are in place when you know there's different positioning. But when I do think about um, you know, this question, you know, I also think about our, our principles. So like the Hitman's principles of democratic organizing that really focus on letting people kind of speak for themselves and joining together around some key shared values, I think is really important um, for our movement. But just as like the Black Liberation Movement, you know, the, the women's movement runs the gamut of different ways of thinking and, you know, tenets and principle. And at the end of, um, you know, at the end of the day, we know it's all about system change. So um, I'm gonna bring in, you know, black feminist Audre Lorde, who, you know, said it eloquently, but, you know, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And so, you know, they may never allow us to temporarily be him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring genuine change. So. I think coming together around like shared principles and, um, you know, points and strategy and work kind of a bit more closely together to get, you know, folks together on this. And, you know, others won't, others will be able to kind of see that they're also, you know, we'll also learn from each other to see where the, the issues, some of the false solutions have come up and really learn about um, that there's no easy fix to, to how we get to where we're trying to go. But like I said, the kind of principal struggle that it takes to really be um, in relationship with each other. And I think we just have to be strategic in this moment and work in coalitions um, with the people who we may not necessarily always have, have agreed with or even seen, saw ourselves aligned with. But we also cannot accept like superficial liberation. So we do have to work at challenging ourselves. Um, our movements, but to, for the the purpose of building uh, power together and and um, for the purpose of li liberation. So I think um, you know I think this that you know we're based in this this intersectional uh, you know we are all in this like intersectional crisis right now, and so those those solutions are going to be important for us all to to. Um, you know, those solutions are going to be important for all of us to to really survive and to live. So we have to kind of struggle through with each other in a very principled way and, and not allow, um, you know, the tensions or the different positions that, that we take to take us off course. Well, I want to open it up now, uh, Monica, to... to some questions from you know those who have joined us in this dialogue uh first want to thank everybody for for joining us and participating um two ways that we could do this i think particularly with a group of uh, of this size uh if everybody's familiar you can either um raise your hand um you know in the uh, uh features down below uh, or you can write a question in uh, to the chat, and then I can just uh, uh, read it directly you know, uh, to Monica. Uh, but the floor uh, is definitely open uh, for any any question that folks may have. Oh. 
Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, yeah. Scully, it's nice to thanks to see you, Monica. Um, my question around this work is around organizing at like the local, state, and federal level. So, like, I know kind of like the kind of Green New Deal and kind of like what's happening at the federal level. And I'm curious how, like, what you all see or if other folks in this group see, like, how the local, the state like how that fits in, including like how that fits into CGA's work. I'm based in California. I know there's a number of CGA members here in California. Um, and, and and like one of, and part of the reason that I'm thinking about that is some of the involvement that I have with Heal Food Alliance. Um, and also like I've been recently nominated, I don't know if I'll get on, but we've been, been recently nominated to the California Food State Board of Food and Agriculture. And so like how like these things can fit together in terms of like the collective strategy. Yes, so uh, one of the things that, that since I started in CJA, um, I began doing the regional work actually through Cooperation Jackson. Um, and so now we're at the point these these last couple of years have been building out a strategy to support our local basis to actually develop um, a translocal organizing model. So our members actually did went through a process together where they like self-nominated, self-elected, like regional conveners um, and have been organizing within their regions and then across across communities too. So one of the things that this actually been the first year we were supposed to be in person and you know, all these things where folks have really been like pushing through, um, but did a lot of power mapping this year um, and looking at, you know, who are some of the key players in those, in each of the, the local communities and then what are some of the ways that we can challenge that on a regional level. Um, and then we're also looking at, you know, policies that can be driven from that, um, from a, you know, local level, but also are there like state strategies that we can be building um, building out to, but building that policy based off of, you know, the, the, the local organizing that's happening. So we are actually in the process of kind of playing around with all of that right now. Um, but I, I think that has, um, you know, that has been the vision for a grassroots organizing in CJA. And so continuing to build that out and see how we can really um, get some wins on a, on a national level. But we really want to focus our policy work on what's happening on a local level so that that, that informs like our, our work nationally because it also has had us, you know, focusing on a lot of diff different things, but being really rooted in like what our members are doing and the support that they need on like building those, the type of legislation that's going to get them um, that they're, they're just transitioning and, and help them build those regenerative economies. So that's just one way we've been doing it. Um, but a lot of learnings um, from it as well. Thanks for that question, Anthony. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Patricia. <laughs> Thank you so much for organizing this, both of you, and for, for, in, for inviting people to come in such an open way to discuss this really important question. I'm, I'm uh, speaking to you from Toronto, Canada, where it's going down to minus 20 tonight. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to ask about the Indigenous yeah. leadership across North America and this new report from the Indigenous Environmental Network that shows that Indigenous led movements and blockades and boycotts are the single most important thing that's limiting carbon emissions now in North America. They've contributed to cutting our emissions by about 25% over the last few years. Um, and it, it relates to something that you were talking about earlier with regard to media and co-optation and the fact that a lot of the most important things that are happening we don't really hear about. Mm. By we, I mean those who are concerned about climate justice. So um, could you share some ideas about what we can do about that kind of miseducation or lack of education of the general population about what is actually going on? Thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, um, I would say, that's a good question. 
you know, some of the things that the CJA has been doing, honestly, has been very direct, di direct and frank and calling, taking strong positions. So these are like, you know, creating different statements that represent the positions of our membership. Um, you know, th so, you know, those are, uh, that's one way to be, to be thinking about that. But also, I think it's a thing of like continuing to tell your story and being present to do that so that it's not erased. Um, so that is, you know, working with other folks and working across movements and making sure that those messages are carrying across movements and really being intentional about sharing messaging, um, you know, across sectors. And, you know, so that's why I think those relationships and us to, to work and across um, sector issues and across movements are important because that also helps us continue to, to make sure that our truths are woven in together. So I really think it's a, um, uh, a thing of, you know, using all the things that are um, at our disposal. Like, I actually am not a social media person, but social media is one of the most effective uh, ways of communication today, and especially since everybody is in, in the house. But it also does come back to organizing um, at, the end of, at the end of that as well, because you have to, you know, be in communication and in community with other folks, too, to even share your message enough for folks to even listen and connect with those experiences. So those are some some things that, that I think about, um, yeah, when addressing like co-optation, but also having to be unapologetic and like calling people out sometimes. Um, and so we have, you know, done that uh, over the course of this year, but when it's for righteousness sake and if it's, you know, uh, what we, you know, I, if it's what we're owed, then we absolutely have have to to go what is for ours. So those are yeah, those are just some of my my initial thoughts on that. We have a question that that came in uh, from Brian, um, who unfortunately is having some some internet challenges up in Vermont. Um, but the question is, how can we work to encourage more collaboration? and solidarity amongst people and groups that share a climate justice perspective. We agree on core principles, including foregrounding frontline communities, the need for systemic slash revolutionary changes and rejecting false solution and political cooptation, but come from different communities with, diff with different backgrounds and perspectives. How can we work better together? Um, so that's a question from, uh, from Brian. Um, yeah, I was just listening to that a little bit. Um, so working in solidarity, so it's not like working in solidarity and um, being able to share a climate justice perspective as well as, okay, so different backgrounds are coming together. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, it's really being intentional about putting your place, yourself, yourself, your community in places where they haven't been um, and not being kind of in a comfortable mode of like, you know, working with the people that you know are on your side. Like you have to kind of work across, uh, work to get some of those people who would, you wouldn't envision yourself working with um, to be on, to be on board. And that, that does take, uh, a bit of time, but it, it, it means investing in uh, relationships. And I think we just need to see also our relationships as much as resources like finance, you know, finances. Um, so it's just a thing of like, yeah, bringing folks to together. Um, and I think like not shying away from where the points of tension are, because that's where people kind of, you know, don't necessarily want to lean into don't want to necessarily lean into and also like um we know how feelings and emotions that we can get passionate about uh, about things at times and that also can cause a disruption in like what we're trying to build as far as liberation so I would um I would say working in solidarity means you kind of being uncomfortable actually um so being being getting in uncomfortable situations and uncomfortable conversations um to to work across those 
those places where we, we're not seeing the same type of wins, like where our strengths, where our weaknesses, and really taking time to, to assess those things, um, but leaning into where our weaknesses are. And yeah, the, the piece around like coming from different um, backgrounds and perspectives, again, this is just investing in, in the relationship piece of, um, of organizing. And that's how, you know, understanding um, and communication happens. So yeah, uh, the, to that point too, where, yeah, showing up for each other, like is about that. Um, those relationships are really important. It's about presence and communication and principal struggle, you know, and keep coming back to the table, keep coming back to the conversation, even as difficult as it is, because we have a whole system that's against us. So if we're not working together and being intentional, about working through our own like points of tension and conflict, then nobody is going to do that for us. So investing in yeah relationship building, um, but also yeah the the pieces that don't feel um, good all the time where the conflict resides. That's most of the time where we need to go. Thanks for that, Laura. Any additional questions? Can I jump back in if no one has oh, yeah. questions, Kelly? Um, this this might be like a silly question, but like um, I'm just like I'm just not familiar with kind of like how like policy works at the federal level. Like, how does it actually happen to get something like a Green New Deal or anything else that like we might actually want that like you know like your CLCJ, CGA like that comes from kind of grassroots organizing to actually make it into something at that level like i just like it's hard for me to conceive um of how that actually happens so, so how policy gets passed on a federal level is your question no well no like how the policies get crafted and how like we can like how our communities actually get wins either included in okay. legislation that like isn't actually what we want but we get some things or like the actual legislation that we want and and I, i'm thinking about like i think part of my question too is Kali, you mentioned at the beginning of the call around kind of like where we are now in terms of like who's in congress and, and who controls congress and where we might be after the midterm elections and just, you know, yeah. And, 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 it, and I think that it's, I, I think there's, I think there's two pieces to my question. Um, one is just like how it, how it actually happens, like how CGA or other groups or other, you know, folks moving concert can like actually influence that legislation in meaningful ways. And then trying, I'm in, just curious about that, but then also trying to tie to like some of the work that like that I and other folks that I know are doing and how, because and I'm, I guess I'm coming from a place of like, it just feels so distant, feels so big and feels so distant and feels so hard. And I know folks are like doing good work to like influence in different ways, but I actually don't have a lot of visibility in like, what are those tangible things and how does that get done? And what are the wins we should be celebrating along the way, et cetera. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Yeah, I feel like Kali probably can answer the first part of it because I'm more to the streets, okay? So what <laughs> CJA does, I'm going to tell you what CJA does. Um, so I'll let Kali give you the, the bigger thing, but we do have different like working groups within our alliance. Um, so we have a, a food sovereignty, reinvest in our power, um, energy democracy, a just recovery working group, Black Caucus, a youth caucus, um, and then we have our grassroots membership base. Um, and so our other members that are networks, alliances, or a base building member, like any type of member can be a part of those, um, those working groups. And so our policy, what our, um, how we do our policy is we look at 
like I said, right now we're building out from the, the local place of like, what are some of the um, doing like power mapping, who are some of the key players and some of the um, the resources and really kind of mapping the resources that are coming into uh, different communities. But we use our members to really, we listen, we do a lot of like listening and storytelling. And this is why I think like narrative is so important, but really listening to what our members are a fan of what, like what's happening on the ground, the legislation that's coming down and also what they need. So we have folks who are able to like write that and build that. So yeah, and I think it takes very special people to know how to write uh, some policy pieces of it um and make it you know make it make sense for that that system but we do take a lot of feedback and um hear from the experiences and really and also do research on like what's happening in the local communities what's happening in the regions to build out those different type of um you know different legislation that will have impact on the federal level so what right now what we want to do is like really hone in on our um our regional strategies, like what the members are doing in those regions so that we have more federal legislation that is anchored in in some of those um, local solutions. So that's how we're doing it. Um, but I don't know, uh, Kali, if you, um, I think like, yeah, just hearing from as many people mm. as you can as an alliance, you know, that's our like working groups. <clears throat> well, only thing I think I'll just uh, add to that um for perspective like it it's it seems like it's so far away right and it seems like it's so challenging um but let's just look at recent history you know let's just look at the 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 history of this pandemic um you know nobody if you would ask i think anybody on this line um would a universal basic, you know, income uh, experiment be tried, you know, within the course of your lifetime, you know, pre-pandemic? Would, would that be would that happen on a national scale? I think all of us rationally would have said no, right? Uh, uh, within this country, given this current kind of dynamics and political consciousness, but uh, the situation was so grave you know, by March of 2020, uh, that it was very clear that some level of mass stimulus had to be inserted into the economy uh, uh, to keep the system from collapsing. Uh, now, it was always contested. You know, there was never any real agreement uh, between the Democrats and Republicans about how much or how long, uh, um, you know, that experiment. But they agreed that something had to happen, right? Now they didn't base that on any science or any historical perspective. Um, and what I mean by that, so everybody's clear, uh, we're just saying to Monica uh, earlier in our, you know, just pre chit chat, um, you know, there should have been more epidemiologists that they really put out at the beginning to explain, you know, this is how the flu of 1918 worked. You know, this is how it spread. This is how long it took. Uh, and if we if we factor in the fact that you know uh, transportation exists that was unimaginable 100 years ago, the volume of it, the extent of it, um, and that that uh, the, the you know the world now is truly global, you know, in the sense that you have folks coming from you have folks coming from uh, you know everywhere from. Uh, hundreds of flights coming in from South Africa, from uh, China, from, you know, South Korea into the United States just alone every day. Um, that it's impossible to keep pathogens from jumping from one border to another border in the world that we live in. Um, and so if, I, mean, I think if a lot of that would have been explained, then you would have had more rational policy that could have been crafted to say, this is going to have to, to last a bit longer for these particular reasons. And that even you know the most reactionary of the Republicans probably would have had to agree or or accede to some of that kind of lasting uh, uh, for them. Ultimately, the the object, objective of both was to get the economy back working healthy, right? And in the sense of doing that, they both made errors in, in different ways of either overpromising, not sharing you know enough about how 
uh, uh, diseases, particularly these flu-borne like diseases, which COVID basically is, like how they spread, how they go from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere on a cyclical basis of which science is known now for well over 100 years, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they could have crafted more policy. But what, but what I'm getting at is that when there's sufficient political will, policy can happen fairly quickly, right? Um, and it's our challenge. The, the challenge ain't the writing, right? The challenge is building the will of, of enough people to change, you know, a, a public dialogue and the public narrative. Um, you know, because they they adjusted real quick, but then they they did a great job of fragmenting things. And if you you know, one of the things that's that uh, Monica spoke to, you know, which we do need to figure out, like you know, uh, left and progressive forces really have to figure out uh, what I would call our our legitimization crisis, right? Which is um, we don't have a fox. Let me just make it practical. We don't have a fox or anything similar to it, which is sharing our views with millions of people day in and day out and, and bombarding them, you know, uh, with lies and nonsense, but at least telling a coherent story about their lie, you know, which is rooted in people's history and, and identities. Uh, 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 and they are very keen on that in a way sometimes we are not. Like we, you know, they, they, we often get accused outside of, of identity politics. And when it's a politics that's just limited in on one focus, that's always a, a, a problem. Right, that doesn't deal with the totality of, of, of how human beings interact and who we are, and the multiple identities that we all have, uh, uh, depending on the context. Uh, but they know how to tell a good story, and and we aren't telling a good story right now. I mean, let's just be honest: we are not really telling a good story, uh, a, a coherent story, and we have to build up our own networks and institutions that are able to do that to help build that consensus. You know, uh, and um, you know. I can speak more to it, but I don't want people, I, what I don't want people to, is to, to walk away with the wrong message and thinking that our struggle is more of a technical one, right? In the sense of like we have to go state by state to craft policy. I'm not negating that in any form or fashion, but the, uh, our real struggle is building the political consensus and the political will. And, and that is going to come by it, uh, uh, right now convincing a lot of people uh, why both sides of the dominant political narrative are getting this wrong. And then what is, what can be done and what can we start doing in our local communities to, to craft solutions from the bottom up? Like, I think that is the, the, the way that we are going to have to figure up this out and recognize that we're working, you know, uh, in, a, in a hole. And what I mean by that is we're not going to match the, either the right or the center, if you want to call the Democrats the center. I think they're all the right myself, but, uh, <clears throat> We're not going to match them in in terms of how much airtime or how much money uh, that they have, and so we have to utilize the tool that's most available to us, and that is interacting with people face to face in our communities. Like that, we do have the time to do, right? That we can make the resources available, which is our time and energy. That we can do. Uh, so it's like us repivoting. And not looking at you know kind of some things as a, as a weakness, but actually as a strength. Like our time is actually a strength. Now, so how do we utilize that time? I think uh, in an organized fashion to be able to reach our neighbors, engage in hard dialogues, uneasy dialogues, uneasy discussions, you know, and 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 be there when it goes you know uh, bad and good. And believe me, you know, not everything. I can speak from my own experience. Not everything is going to go smoothly. Uh, uh, that is a false expectation, uh, uh, but just be, be, try to be, you know, as, as forthright and blunt and honest with folks and then be there for the long conversation. Like I'm not really going anywhere. You know, we all live on this same little round ball floating in space and, and uh, uh, even Elon Musk is going to be here for a while. You know, he's not going, he, he ain't getting off easy himself. So we might as well as keep, keep talking about this and figure out a way that we can work some things out. Thanks for that, Kali. Appreciate it. But I would say, you know, just I know we're coming to a close. I would definitely share that. I don't think I, I want to encourage everybody here and everybody who might listen to this. Like, 
Um, we really need to interrogate this last two, now going on three years, really critically. Uh, because a lot of things that we were told were just not possible um, have proven to be possible, right? So like one of the things, you know, uh, I remember in a much younger days from the Rio conversation in 1992, you know, being, being somewhat involved on the periphery of some of that stuff. But, but paying attention to it, the first thing that came from, you know, most of the big corporations and, and uh, you know, the, the, the G7 nations in particular was that the global economy is too big, it's too complicated uh, to make these decisive shifts that would, you know, benefit the, 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 the ecology and be sustainable. And we saw in March of last year, again, that when the political will is there, they can shut the global economy down like that. <laughs> Right, so it's like, no, you just got exposed for your lie that you've been feeding us off for 25 plus years that is too complex or it's too big or it's too insurmountable, right? Like when you thought that th things were, your life was seriously under threat, you changed real quick, right? Um, so I think we need to hone in on that and be like, well, wait, wait a minute. What, a lot of that was how they interpreted something that they didn't fully grasp how can we turn around and say, like, you know, like, like, let's imagine that we all in the, what's that movie? Because that's basically where we are. I thought it was a good analogy. It was corny, but that the don't look up or whatever that movie, like, you know, uh, how do we get to that point? Because I've always made the position that basically we are kind of like the dinosaurs with one major distinction. We are at least conscious that, you know, the asteroid is coming, right? They weren't conscious as far as we know. <laughs> they weren't conscious you know, of that it was coming. We know full well what's coming down the pipeline. So when are we going to act and take responsibility to do something about it? That's the real question for all of us. So I want to uh, if, see if there's any, like one or two more burning questions. If not, you know, we will let uh, Monica go and get back to the pile of uh, Zoom meetings that I know she has <laughs> uh, 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 locked in. Uh, so if there's, if there's one or two more questions, uh, we'll take them in the next couple of minutes. If not, um, if we can call it a day. Well, Monica, any last parting, you know, nuggets you want to leave us and last Jews or gems you want to? Leave with us before we close out. Organize, organize, organize. Organize, organize, organize. Like you have, that's, that's my message. Continue to organize. I mean, Kali said a lot of stuff um, here too, just around like what is possible when we put our time and resource together um, and see our resource, resources as our time, our labor, like what we can physically do to meet our own needs. So, I am thankful to be here. I'm looking forward to like, yeah, if there's any ways or um, offerings that people have, my other two co-EDs, um, just sending y'all love also from them. But we also, you know, need support as well. So if there's like, yeah, any way to get in touch, if anybody has, I don't care if it's a good message or if it's like just sharing some strategy, we love to connect with folks outside of here. So. I want to say thank you all and um yeah let's continue to organize thank you Carly too for uh yeah inviting me and holding the space yeah we got you know I'm, I'm gonna get you out there I appreciate you I need to this sit down with possible. you and learn a little bit I need to sit down with you some more and learn a little bit pick your brain some more when, when you get out of quarantine <laughs> <laughs> sounds good uh thank everybody for participating <laughs> We'll be doing mm -hmm. this again, you. Um, you know, next month. Uh, our, our guest uh, next month uh, is going to be from uh, uh, the Red uh, Nation. Uh, uh, Nick Estes will be joining us. Um, then after that, uh, we'll have uh, uh, Tom Goldtooth. So those will be the, the next two sessions that we'll have uh, in February, in March. Uh, so be on the lookout. And again, thank you all. Uh, for uh, the ISC, the Institute of Social Ecology. This is Kali Kuno signing out. Thank you so much. Thank you.